So, how do you do? <laughs> oh, thank you. It's, it is indeed a strange question, because what does it mean? I mean, how do I do? How do I do what? You're probably thinking. But it's what, how we meet in English. And you know, now we've officially met. Um, we haven't really got a conversation going, have we? So let me ask you another question. What do you do? That's easier to un answer, isn't it? You understand it. You understand, I mean, what do you mean for a living? What's your speciality, your profession, your USP? And because you understand it and you can answer it, our conversation can get going. But now I'm going to ask you a, a third, slightly harder question. What will you do? What will you be doing in five, 10, 15 years from now? Do you know the answer? Do you at least know what you'd like it to be? Perhaps, maybe not. Well, whatever you're thinking, I'm afraid to say you're probably wrong anyway. Because according to a report called Fast Forward 2030, as many as half of today's occupations are going to disappear over the next 10 to 15 years. And at the same time, as many as half of what will be the key occupations in the year 2030 don't yet exist. So half disappearing and half yet to be invented. I mean, that's pretty scary, isn't it? But is it really as crazy as it first sounds? Let's have a quick look back at jobs that didn't exist just 20 years ago. And remember, back in 1995, some of us can remember, we used to access the internet over dial-up modem. In 1995, Amazon.com sold its first book online. Google was launched in 2008, Facebook 2004. The iPhone came to the market in 2007 and Android the following year. So that puts that in context. And over the same period, the executive boardroom has also changed complexion quite a lot. Before 1995, information technology, IT, used to be just part of the finance department, of course. But since then, I and T have each made their own independent way to the director's suite. And they've been followed by marketing, HR, strategy, innovation. And now we're starting to see digital and social responsibility get their seats at the table too. So which jobs are going away? Well, in a nutshell, it's those jobs that have been now automized by machines or by artificial intelligence or which have been replaced by new technology, new processes, or new business models. I mean, after all, how much longer are you going to keep on reading paper-based magazines or using petrol to recharge your self-driving car? This gives us a bit of a problem. We live in a world with a culture of experts where each of us is meant to choose one thing we're going to be good at which we'll develop a deep expertise in, as we've heard already this evening, and therefore become the go-to person, the, the master of that domain. But what do you do if your chosen occupation is one of the ones that disappears? What do you do next? And how do we prepare and teach ourselves and our children for jobs that don't even exist yet? To answer these questions, we're going to have to rethink the way we approach the working world to keep more opportunities open than our current highly focused approach permits. What could we do? Well, one thing we could do is try and specialize in more than one thing. This clicker is going crazy. <laughs> but in our current world, you're not allowed to be good at more than one thing. I mean, if you say you're good at more, m m many things, then you'll say, well, you're suspicious, we don't trust you, or you're a generalist. And the term a jack of all trades, which we use in English, literally means someone who is genuinely good at many things, at anything he puts his hand to. But when we use it, there's always this subtext, either spoken or just implied, that by being spread so thinly across the, the whole domain, you'll no longer have enough deep knowledge to be master of anything at all. But it, it wasn't always like that. 500 years ago, and you had a glimpse, one of the greatest and most extraordinary men in history came to live in France. 
Leonardo da Vinci, who's now gone shy. Leonardo was a master painter, sculptor, poet, writer, mathematician, engineer, inventor, architect, botanist, anatomist, musician. I mean, it's a very long list. And he is really the very epitome of what we today call a Renaissance man, a polymath, a fully rounded person, mentally fit and physically healthy. And this classical ideal was actually not so unusual at the time. All true gentlemen of the period had the same aspiration to be a jack of all trades and master of some. Da Vinci was just a bit better at it than the others. So why did we change? When did we stop being so versatile? Well, 200 years ago, there was another extraordinary man in France. And please listen very carefully. I'm going to say something you don't often hear from an Englishman. I admire Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> Napoleon was a brilliant military commander and strategist. And he was visionary as an architect of the new laws, the grand institutions and academies he created for his new France. But did you know he was also an excellent mathematician? He discovered a theorem in geometry, which is now named after him. And he was equally well versed in the arts. He is known to have met with Goethe. And the two men discussed philosophy, poetry and literature at great length. And after which the great Goethe described it as one of the most enlightened and enlightening conversations he had ever had. So Napoleon was himself a Renaissance man. Which makes it a bit ironic that it's his academic system, with its concours and its grand école, to identify and nurture the creme de la creme, the intellectual elite, that is in many ways responsible for the demise of Renaissance man and the rise of the culture of experts we have in France today. Now, to be fair to Napoleon, life was simpler back then and more predictable, so having a standardised way of analysing, planning and managing the world was that much more feasible. Today, the world changes so quickly and is so complex, we no longer have the time to spend such lengthy analytical processes to find our perfect solution. The world will move on before we get there. No, we have to be more agile, more versatile, find our solution quickly while the window of opportunity is still there. We need to accept that good enough and now is much better than perfect and too late. Which means we need to relearn how to approach the world and relearn even how to learn. We need to spend less time theorizing and more time doing, experimenting, and being creative in our quest for new ideas, new solutions. Because there's one requirement that's not going to go away, it's the need for innovation. Constant, continuous, disruptive, transformational innovation. In other words, we need to keep on thinking outside of the box. This expression comes back from the 1970s, when there were a lot of consultants going around giving creativity workshops and using the now familiar nine dots problem. And I guess a few of you have seen this before. Because, it's very simple, the consultants say all you have to do is to go through all nine dots without lifting your pen, using as few continuous straight lines as possible. And very quickly, pretty much everyone in the room would find a solution using five lines. And the consultant would say, well, that's OK. But can't you find a solution with only four lines? Uh, I imagine a few of you may know the solution, but back then it was all very new. So the consultant could proudly reveal the solution and say, there you go. You see, you need to be thinking outside of the box. And they'd go on to explain how that box represents your current ways of thinking with all its rules and its best practices and other things that are preventing you from being creative. And it's only once you 
challenge those constraints, which are largely self-imposed constraints, are you able to find the green fields or blue skies ideas? But we mustn't stop there. The world catches up quickly, and our breakthrough idea of today is tomorrow's mainstream. It's no longer an innovation, so we need to push on. Can we find a solution with only three lines? We, we might be able to. <laughs> Indeed, we can. Because once we realize that the dots actually have a certain size, we can do this. And bam, that's another constraint thrown away. And we need to keep on pushing forward, pushing forward. And eventually, we might find a limit. I mean, could we do it with just one line? You look like a clever man. Are you an astrophysicist? No. No, no. Do we have any astrophysicists here tonight? Well, that's a pity. <laughs> but as I understand it, we could actually start drawing our line in any direction at all. And thanks to the curvature of time and space, if we keep going long enough, we would eventually go through every point in the universe, including our nine. Now, when I was making these slides and testing the animations, I was interrupted by my eight-year-old son. And he asked me, Daddy, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I explained it to him. And when I'd finished, he said to me, but, but Daddy, I can do it with one line too. I've got to see this. So I said, well, go on, you, you show me. And he went to my desk and he picked up a fat highlighter pen and dragged it across the screen. Uh, who needs astrophysicist anyway, huh? But the point is that we need to keep going through the constraints and challenging them and breaking them. But as we do so, we're getting further and further away from our own frame of reference, our comfort zone, and deeper and deeper into our zone of incompetence until eventually we're in the dark. So even if we do get an idea, we can no longer see if it's good or not. In fact, we may not even recognize it as a possibility. We're lost. And that's because thinking outside of the box is not the full picture. It's, it's not enough by itself. What do we do when we're lost? We need to find other people, people who are different enough to ourselves, that they can see our faraway idea as something in their comfort zone, which means that they are able to help us to develop and bounce the idea around and turn it into a new solution using our collective intelligence. So it says it takes two to tango. It takes a team to make a difference. And if we're going to work well with these different people, we need to find a common language. There needs to be some overlap between their boxes and ours. Because innovation is really what happens when different worlds come together, collide, and coalesce to form something new. But when everyone's so hyper-specialized, there's a lot of space between those boxes. Th those world collisions are difficult to bring about. <coughs> so what could we do? We, we could get more and more people until eventually we cover the whole map. And then whatever idea we'd have, we would find someone knowledgeable to help us. But if the boxes remain small, so does the overlap. So rather, we need to be more like Renaissance man. And that means using every opportunity to revitalize, reawaken our childlike curiosity, and seize every opportunity to open up our box and fill it and expand it with new, 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 new knowledge, new experiences, and therefore increase the chance of overlap, which will allow us to communicate and to collaborate with other people better. And sure, you can still have your specialities, your, your favorite subjects. Those will always be good. But it needs to be based on a much wider platform so you can participate in more of the important conversations of tomorrow. And that's why we're here tonight. That's what this evening is all about. To encourage you to challenge your self-imposed self perceived constraints. To break through your personal boundaries to open your eyes and broaden your mind. <laughs>